Well, good evening. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to pick up where Pastor James left us uh, last week. Uh, And so just doing that, thinking about tonight's message, I was just thinking about sort of uh, my life as a parent. It's a kind of a big part of my life. And there's just certain things they never tell you about being a parent uh, when, uh, before you have kids. You know, everyone kind of tells you the obvious. They don't tell you, though, how much parenting is basically like 90% bending over and picking things up. It's just what it is all the time. Uh, And one of the things that I've noticed is that my kids, I love them dearly, but they have this really amazing skill that if, if uh, Whitney and I clean up a room, we could spend all day, we could spend all week cleaning up a room, and they can mess it up right away, just immediately, just demolish it. You know, it's why we say the phrase, this is why we can't have nice things. Um, I don't remember if my parents said it as a kid, but they probably should have. But I feel like that's kind of what happens here in Genesis chapter 3. You know, we've been talking about God's beautiful in perfect creation and how he made this uh, overflowing garden, this land full of all sorts of beautiful things. And he put man and woman in this garden paradise to serve him, uh, to have dominion over this, to enjoy everything there except one tree. And yet they messed it up. We, we look around our world and we, it, it, I don't think it takes much to convince someone that's, that something's wrong. If you look in your own heart, if you look in your own life, I don't think it takes much to say things are broken. They don't work the way that we would expect them to work. So we're going to talk tonight uh, just about how that damage came to exist in creation and how it's damaged our own hearts and how we have to now live with this broken world and what are our options as we, as we navigate this world. And so we're going to talk about this really fun topic of sin, right? Everyone loves to show up to church and hear the preacher yell about sin, but it is an important topic. Because if we don't understand our sin, if we don't understand how sin has affected the world, then we'll never, for example, understand justice. Everyone today wants Justice. You know, when something is broken, you want to fix it. Our son broke his arm uh, in 2018, and what did we do? We didn't just leave it there. We took him to the hospital, and they set his arm, and they put it in a cast, and they x-rayed it. They fixed it. When, uh, I feel like we live in a world that we can tell something's out of tune, you know, like a guitar string that's, that's you know, just off, but, but so many people don't know how to get it to be in tune. See, when something's broken and you fix it, well, if sin isn't real, if, if the world that we live in is just a product of time and chance, then there's no such thing as justice. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong. It's just that is what it is. This is, how cre- this is how the world has evolved. But if it is true that God's perfection was broken by sin, then we understand that there is something else for us other than living in sin. That there is something else for this world other than being just broken. That there is something good for us to work toward. Actually, there is something good for us to receive as God works it out in our lives. You know, this is true on a macro and a micro level. We see that sin has broken systems, it's broken societies, it's broken institutions, And I can see that in my own heart, sin is at war. That sin affects my thoughts and sin affects my choices. It doesn't seem hard to prove that sin is a problem, yet so many of us walk around denying the fact that we are sinners living in a sinful world. But think about it. We have have access to more information in our pockets than any other human had in all the libraries of all of history. Yet we are just as deluded, just as violent as we ever have been. I mean, just ask yourself, when, when someone receives power, why does it corrupt rather than help? When someone receives money, why does it seem to poison rather than heal? 
Why am I drawn towards selfishness and apathy? Why is my heart full of anger? Why am I mean? See, if, if we admit that sin is real and dangerous and has affected our world, then, and only then, can we understand that there is a hope for us. The Bible says that we have to admit our sin if we're to seek our Savior. And this isn't pessimism. This isn't cynicism. I'm not, I'm not advocating that we walk around uh, just as a- angry, yelling at everyone about hellfire and brimstone all the time. But I am trying to say, look, if we want to see real hope for change through the gospel, then we have to admit that I'm not inherently good, that I'm not just good at heart, that I actually am infected by sin and need a savior to heal me. That if I just walk around and ignore it, if I pretend like I'm not lost, then guess what, I'm never gonna be found. So here's kind of the big picture of today's message, that we are sinners by nature and sinners by choice. We've inherited sin and we participate in it every day. So the passage we're gonna look at shows that our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned and and after them, sin spread into all of creation like a disease. And I think of sin uh, like like, uh, like a river running through a canyon. It's, it's carved this path in all of us because we were born sinners so that our natural inclination in and of ourself is just to go down that path of sin. But when the gospel comes in, God uproots that. God uh, carves a new path. God gives us new desires and new directions, freeing us from sin. Not that we won't still sin, but we now have a choice. We now have freedom to choose to obey God. So here's the story of the first sin in the garden. Look in Genesis chapter three as I read the whole chapter, starting in verse one. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, that's a roller coaster. There's a lot there. There's no way we could dissect every aspect of this passage um, in its fullest detail. But I'm just going to try to walk through and see just what it looked like for sin to enter into this pristine garden. The first thing that we're going to take a look at is we're going to see the anatomy of temptation. We're going to see what happens. So, so all of a sudden, out of nowhere, in this beautiful, perfect paradise, we have this serpent, this snake, which seems out of place because uh, if you are reading this, Moses uh, is writing this to the Israelites, and they would know immediately that, that snakes are not good. If you think snakes are good, then I, we need to have a conversation, right? Like anytime I see some street performer with like a snake around his neck, I'm like, what are we doing here? Uh, snakes are dangerous, right? Snakes uh, hurt other animals. Snakes poison, right? And it describes this snake as more crafty than any other beast of the field. You, you already wonder if you've read chapters one and two that if Adam is supposed to guard the garden, then how did this snake, this crafty creature, even get there in the first place? But, but snakes are dangerous on one level, right? Because they can hurt you. Snakes are a vibrant personification of danger. If you wanna see me scream and run, then either I can be in the ocean and seaweed touch my foot, or if I'm walking on a path and I see a, snake that, a stick that looks like a snake, right? You run, right? I don't want to be around it. I don't want to hear how it's one of the good ones, right? Like there's this, this whole like group of snakes that are, have a PR campaign about how they're the good ones. The snakes scare me. I actually heard a comedian talking about a, guy, a friend of his who had a pet snake, and he, and he had this snake for 10 years, and one day this snake started constricting around his arm. And he eventually had to kill the snake by cutting its head off. And, and he had permanent nerve damage in his arm. And he was talking to his friend, and he was like, I don't know what happened. I'm like, I know exactly what happened. The snake got big enough. It's been thinking about this for 10 years and is just now big enough to give it a try, right? Snakes are dangerous. They're a natural enemy to, to everything else. They're cold-blooded, right? Like this is everything about snakes are scary to me. But if, as we read the Bible, we see that this particular serpent is more than just a regular serpent. Right? If you uh, turn to the end of the book of Revelation, right? sometimes if you're one of those readers who you can't handle the suspense, if you just go to the end, you can find out what happens. In Revelation chapter 12, here's how John describes, the, describes Satan. He calls him that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. As we, as we read through Scripture, we see that this particular serpent is... Satan come to tempt the first couple. But there's so much we can learn about Satan and there's so much we can learn about temptation just by understanding how this serpent fits in the garden. The, the first thing that I would think, or one of the things that I would notice, is that the snake is still made by God. Right? Nothing has been made that God did not make. So no matter how powerful, no matter how crafty, no matter how ingenious this serpent is, it is still subordinate to God. This serpent is sneaky, but he is still subordinate to God. He isn't, Satan isn't in charge. He might be smart, but he's not in charge. And so because he's not in charge, the serpent can't just overpower God. He instead goes to God's creation and starts to use his, uh, his craftiness to tempt them away from trusting God. Now, I don't, I don't know if you found this to be the case. I think I found this to be the case. That Satan, because he is crafty, he doesn't want to shock you. He wants to lure you into sin. Right? Satan doesn't often just come right out and say, don't trust God. He starts putting doubt into your mind. He starts tricking you away. He takes something good that God has made and he starts to twist it. Really, I think that's what we see here in sin, is that, that sin is the perversion of something good. So, so what does Satan do? He takes something good like in Genesis chapter 2, like sex between a man and a woman, 
and he twists it, and we see it in things like pornography that enslave and entrap. Right? He takes something good like leadership and he twists it into abuse. He takes something good like food and he twists it into gluttony. He takes something good like work and he twists it into hoarding and materialism and selfishness. He takes something good like worship and he twists it into legalism. I imagine if you look at your own heart and and you think of the ways that you sin, it is Satan twisting the promises of God. And you can actually see his tactics. The first tactic that you'll even see is just the very dialogue that Eve has with the devil. Her first mistake is that she's even willing to entertain a conversation with the serpent. You should be inquisitive. You should want to learn. You should want to talk to all kinds of people. You know who you shouldn't talk to? The devil. Right? There's, there's, a, there's a moment when you just need to turn around and run away. There's a time and place to have a conversation. This is not that time. Like however fast you hang up on telemarketers, you need to hang up on Satan faster than that. That's not a conversation you need to have. He's smart. He's crafty. He's going to trick you. So she starts this conversation that she shouldn't have. And then what, how does Satan begin to twist? First he, he adds, he, he starts to create doubt in God's word. He asks this question. It seems like a subtle question. But taking it on its own, you might think, well, this is a harmless question. He asked this, did God actually say? Did God really say? Did he? Are you sure you heard God right when he commanded you not to eat of that tree? So he's not outright contradicting, he's just asking a question. He's using a suggestion. So she's entered into this dialogue she shouldn't enter into. She, he's starting, the, Satan is starting to doubt God's word. And then he completely redefines God's commands. First, you see Eve overcorrect in answering and say, But God said, You shall not eat of the tr- fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. So she's added some. And then what, is, what does Satan say once they've quibbled over terms and, and, and asked this question? Here's the counterclaim. He says, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So he goes from, did God say, to God is wrong. And that's the progression of sin in my heart. First, I see God's clear command. Then I start to go, well, is it really so clear? Then I start to say, it's wrong. And so before long, she's gone from a conversation to disobedience And now Satan is actually blaming God. He says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He's saying this, God didn't just command you to do something, he lied to you to keep you from something good. That God doesn't want you to have what he has. Now Satan is being his crafty self. Don't ever take Satan's word for it. He's never telling the full truth. Because he's promising one thing, knowledge, but he's leaving out all the consequences. There was this period of time where there was this really popular weight loss drug called FinFin. Do y'all remember the FinFin days? And it promised that you would lose a lot of weight. But it failed to mention that it would damage your heart valve and kill you. See, that's what Satan does. Look, look at all that you'll gain. But he never tells you what you're going to lose. And that's what sin does. Sin promises all sorts of things, but it never tells you what you're going to lose. So what Satan has done is he's creating doubt in Eve's mind. Doubt that God is going to give you good things. Doubt that what God has given you is actually for your good. You know, skepticism is sometimes appropriate. Skepticism is never appropriate towards God. God is never... This is the truth. God is never doing anything to harm you, ever. He's only doing things for your good. And that's how you can tell the shift in tone between God's creation and Satan. In original creation, it is 
uh, in, the, in the story of the garden, it is explained in terms of generosity. Look at all God has given you. You can have anything here. But what did Satan say? Why is he keeping the one thing from you? You know, I got, I got kids, and our two-year-old is in the phase where the one thing you tell him not to do is the one thing he wants to do. You can have every toy in this house except this one. What does he do? I want that one. What, what does God, God tells us, look, you can have all of this joy, but stay away from this thing, which is actually going to hurt you. And we're like, hmm, why does he not want me to have that thing? What's he keeping from me? Why is he trying to hurt me? When I tell my son, don't climb on that stool, I'm not doing it to hurt him. I'm doing it to protect him because he's going to fall. He's going to hit his head. And he's going to cry, and it's bad for him. But all he sees is, hmm, I can't have it. I want it. The accusation of Satan is that he's keeping something good from us. God only gives us good things and protects us from bad things. When God says no, it is not to hurt you, but to protect you. The prophet Jeremiah puts it this way in Jeremiah 5, 25. He says, your iniquities have turned these away. Your sins have kept good from you. Listen to that. Here's the truth. God does not keep good from you. Sin keeps good from you. See, sin promises good. It can't deliver. I mean, just look at the difference between the, the God of the Bible and the ancient gods that the Israelites were surrounded by. What in most religions do you have to do for God? You have to worship him, right? And, and how do most religions demonstrate worship? You sacrifice. You know, I've been in cultures where they still sacrifice to God, to their version of God, where they'll kill animals. The idea is this, I feed God. Now, did, did God ever do that in the Bible? No. He didn't say feed me. He said, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to give you every tree in the garden. You don't provide for me, I provide for you. He wants what's best for us. But Adam and Eve, even though they have all this good they can ever have, they want the one thing they can't have. They want to be like God. And it backfires on them. Because all of Sa Satan's temptations are, are shortcuts. They're always, his craftiness is not real wisdom. It always circumvents the path that God has. It's a false path and it leads to a curse. It's not, it doesn't give them the enlightenment they were hoping for. It says in verse 6 that the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and it was desirous to make her wise. She took its fruit and ate and, her, and gave some to her husband and he ate. The fruit tastes good and more importantly, it's going to give them what they want. And here's the truth. They turned to the fruit to get what they can only get from God. Here's what Tim Keller says about sin, and I think it applies to this passage perfectly. He says, why do we lie or fail to love or break our promises or live selfishly? Of course, the general answer is because we are weak and sinful. But the specific answer is there is something besides Jesus Christ that we feel we must have to be happy. Something that is more important to our heart than God. Something that is enslaving our heart through inordinate desires. Isn't that true of Adam and Eve? They have a relationship, an unfettered, unhindered relationship with God. And they think they still need something else. And isn't that what we do? God, if I could just have fill in the blank, then I'll be happy. If that blank is not God himself, you will never be happy. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll cost you more than you want to pay. I almost showed this video tonight, but I'll just describe it to you. Whitney and I were laughing when we saw this a few months ago. It's this little boy, and he is taking a bite of Hershey's cocoa powder. Right? He sees this this bin of cocoa powder, and he thinks, Hershey's? Chocolate? This must be amazing. But what he doesn't understand is that this is cocoa powder. This is unsweetened, bitter chocolate powder. And he takes a big old bite, 
And the look on his face is shock and disappointment. And he starts to cough and powdered cocoa starts flying out of his nose like a little dragon, right? Like just breathing cocoa. But that's how we are with sin. We see it and it looks good. And we take a big old bite and then we realize this didn't give me anything that I wanted. It didn't get me anywhere I wanted to go. All I'm left with now is shame. It says their eyes were open, they got knowledge, and they knew that they were naked. See, previously they were naked and unashamed in Genesis 2.25. Now they're naked and they feel shame. You know, we, we can identify with this, right? That's one of the worst uh, dreams you can have is that, you, you know, the, the famous dream is you go to school naked, right? Or you're, you're giving a speech in front of people naked. I think even if, you, I think nakedness, our, our shame around nakedness is one of the primary examples to show that we are sinners, you know, in rebellion to God. Because if, if you think of evolution, evolution can explain a lot of stuff. It does not explain why we wear clothes. The only thing that explains why we wear clothes is shame over our nakedness. See, all, all of the security, all of the, the, the belonging that they had in God is now ruptured, and they realize that they're alone, and they're vulnerable. And so what do they try to do? They try to cover it up. Sin often leads us to try to cover it up, and they try to sew themselves coverings out of fig leaves. Now, I know you've seen all these artistic representations of Adam and Eve covered in fig leaves. Have you ever tried to sew, and have you ever used a leaf? Fig leaves are terrible for sewing. Do not make your clothes out of fig leaves. This is a terrible attempt to cover up. You know, like, what, is God going to show up having left them naked and be like, hmm, well, something's different, but I don't know what it is. He's going to know. This is a bad way to hide it. You know, when we fail to trust God and when we disobey, the result is never for our good. Sin hurts us, and, but too often we try to cover it up. We try to minimize it. We try to hide it. We dilute it. This is what a bad apology is. You know, we've heard all these bad apologies. Like, I didn't know, or I'm sorry if anyone was offended. Those aren't apologies. Apologies say, I sinned, and I'm sorry. Hiding sin only makes it worse. And that's what they did. So then they, they come into this confrontation with God in verses 8 through 13. It says that God shows up, and they have to face the music that they heard, verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Rather than confess, they hid. Sin ruins this beautiful relationship with God. They should have heard God coming and, and said, I want to run to him. What an opportunity to fellowship with God. But instead, because of their sin, because of their shame, they run away. But God still lovingly pursues them. He asks them these questions that he already knows the answer to. He says, where are you? In verse 9. In verse 11, he says, who told you you were naked? He, he knows all of these things. But there's an important lesson here about confession for us. Hiding is the opposite of confessing. One of the things you and I will be tempted to do when we sin is to avoid God. Now, we can't hide from God. I will probably sin multiple times between when I'm done preaching, maybe even while I'm preaching, I'm sorry, and before I get home. And the, the, the instinct I will have is to hide from God. Now, what does hiding look like? I don't know. Maybe for you, hiding from God means avoiding his word or avoiding the gathering of believers. I think that's often the case. When we are ashamed, rather than go and admit it, we run the opposite direction. Hiding, though, only hurts you. Hiding puts a burden on you that you are not intended to carry. Isolation in your sin is deadly to your walk with the Lord. That's why God created a mechanism for us to confess. We confess to God, but he gave us a church to confess too. Confess your sins one to another so that they may be forgiven. See, when, when you have this heavy weight of sin on you and you come and confess it to another believer, you allow them to carry it with you. I promise you this, that if you are suffering in sin and you come and confess it to us, we will do our best to carry it with you. We have no desire to shame you. We have no desire uh, to, to rub your face in your sin. We have every desire to carry it with you so that you can experience freedom and joy that comes with an unbroken relationship with God. When I was a youth pastor early in my um, 
uh, ministry. It was probably about 10 or 12 years ago. I don't know. It was a long time ago. Um, I was still, I didn't have any kids, so I was dumb enough to agree to take the kids to a lock-in. And lock-ins are of the devil. Uh, that's, that's a good lesson, right? That's, the devil's going to show up at a lock-in. And so we rented out this YMCA, and it was a mistake from the beginning because uh, we were having a good time, but these kids just were breaking everything in this place. The bill we got when we were done with this was not good. But in this one instance, these kids were playing with one of those big, bouncy exercise balls, and they were just kicking it across this giant uh, classroom. Well, you know that in most of these classrooms, they have mirrors along the wall. And so they, they shattered one of these giant floor-to-ceiling mirrors. But what they didn't realize is that there are security cameras. So we could go look, and we could see. I, saw, I, I looked at a camera and saw exactly who was in the room and who kicked the ball. So I call four teenagers into my, in, to, to see me, and I ask them this question. Who broke the mirror? I already knew the answer. <laughs> this was an opportunity for them to say, I broke the mirror. Because you know what? If, if one of them would have said, I'm sorry, I, I sinned, I messed up, it was an accident, I broke the mirror, I probably would have said, you know, that's okay, please don't do it again. But instead they said, I don't know. Right, this is what Adam is doing in the garden. God is saying, who, who did this? Where are you? Who told you this? This is an opportunity for them to come clean, but what does Adam do? Does he come clean and admit his sin? No, he blames someone else. Verse 12, the man said, the woman whom you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. He blames the woman. He didn't admit it. Rather than being one flesh, he, sin has now divided Adam and Eve, pitted them against each other. He's not protecting her. He's not taking the fall for her. He is now throwing her under the bus and backing it up. Sin divides. We see that division replicated through all of creation. There is no way to have unity around sin. Sin only produces disunity. And so then the woman starts to blame the snake. What, what seems to be happening is that they are more scared of getting caught than they are upset about their sin. I read, the, I read the, these words from psychologist Diane Langberg. She, she says this, Scripture is clear that sin is the worst thing in the world. Listen to this. Scripture is clear that sin is the worst thing in the world. Not exposure, not getting caught, not the loss of all things. See, what happens is when we do something bad or something bad happens uh, in our church or in our community, we have this feeling of protection. We want to protect ourselves. And we miss the fact that sin is the bad thing. And then worse than even blaming the woman, though, is listen to how Adam blames. He blames God. He says, the woman who you gave me. God, you shouldn't have given me this woman. If she hadn't come, this is, God, this is, basically Adam's saying, God, this is your fault. What this shows is that Adam and Eve's sin is not an accident. They weren't simply tricked. They rebelled against God. See, when, you, when you're tricked and you realize that you repent, but when you, but when you willfully sin, you double down, you deflect. So what's the excuse? Is it someone else's fault? Do I, should I have had more information? Should God have told me more about this tree? Now here's what happened. They broke the command of God that they knew about. Forget about what they didn't know. Forget about what knowledge they didn't have. Forget about what wisdom they were missing. What they knew, they disobeyed. And so we can spend all day explaining how sin has infected the world, but here's the reality. Are there commands of God that you and I know about that we've broken? And if the answer is yes, then we stand condemned as sinners. And there are consequences to our sin. Look at the consequences to Adam and Eve's sin. Everyone is cursed. First, the serpent is cursed, says the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The snake goes from crafty to cursed. He goes from 
uh, sort of above all of creation to eating the dust of the ground. And we see that Satan gets a death sentence here. That God one day through the seed of the woman will crush Satan. And these curses are not just local personal curses. They do impact Adam and Eve and the serpent, but they extend to all of creation. There are global implications to what has happened in this moment. There are universal implication to what is going on. The effect of sin, does, it has a personal dimension. The New Testament calls this the flesh. It has a demonic instigation. We see the devil here at work, but it also manifests itself in the systems, which the New Testament calls the world. This has in, impacted every one of us. This is why every one of us is born a sinner. No matter how cute you are and adorable you are as a child, you are still born a sinner. Your will bends in toward yourself rather than toward God, and we need a Savior. See how the woman is cursed. It says, to the woman, he said, I will, this is verse 16, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. What once was a blessing of marriage and of being fruitful and multiplying is now a curse. What once was a blessing of having a husband to be one flesh with is now a curse because now there's competition and domination. A husband who should be nurturing is now abusing. We see that all the time. The blessings of life in childbirth now also reveal the painful consequences of sin. And to, and to the man in verses 17 to 19, it says to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and, shall, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember last week, uh, Pastor James explained how the word for Adam and the word for ground sounds similar in Hebrew. You have Adam and Adama, same, very similar words. One means Adam, right? Really clever transliteration. And one means ground, Adam was supposed to rule over the ground, but now the ground is ruling over Adam. It's not, things are not the way they're supposed to be. We see the beauty of God's creation, but they are not, it is not the way it is supposed to be. Sin has frustrated our created purpose, but that purpose still remains. You know, why do we still pursue marriage even though we know it's difficult? Because that's what God created us for, even though sin breaks it. Why do we found, find value in work even when it is full of hardship? Because we're still created for that. It is still a beautiful purpose. Everything is beautiful and broken. And so we live now in the in-between of the garden of perfection and our redemption in heaven, and we have to learn how to live in trust of God in this moment. See, we have eternity in our hearts, but sin in our bones. And we need new life from God and regeneration from God to fix it. So the consequence of man and woman is they are now kicked out of the garden. They didn't get what they thought they were gonna get. They wanted to, they wanted to know good and evil. And here's the trick of Satan. They did get to know something, but it didn't take them to where they wanted to go. Remember what it said. They wanted to have the knowledge of good and evil so they could be like God. That's what Satan promised them. One of my favorite commentators puts it this way. He says, man, who had been created like God in the beginning, made in his image, found himself after the fall curiously like God. See, even God himself says that uh, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil in verse 22. But he is no longer with God in the garden. Man's happiness, man's good, does not consist of, of his being like God so much as it does his being with God and enjoying the blessings of his presence. So everything they gained does not make up for everything that they lost. They're kicked out. They're cast out of the presence of God in the garden. Sin has separated them from life. They cannot exist in God's presence. And now they are cursed to death. But it doesn't stop there. Thankfully, there are just tiny hints of hope that I want to just end with. I want to just focus on two hints of hope we see in this passage. The first is this in verse 15, that there is a serpent crushing seed. Look in verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. If you trace the conflict between the seed of 
of the woman and the serpent through all of Scripture, you see that the seed of the woman is none other than Jesus Christ, who will crush Satan, giving the final defeat to death and offering us a restored relationship with God. Paul says in Romans 16, 20, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. In that passage in Revelation 12 that I, read, that I said earlier, fully it says this, the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Jesus is the special person, the seed of the woman who fights on our behalf to defeat sin and Satan. In our sin, here's where it points us, that we need a savior. And so the rest of scripture is leading us to that savior who is Jesus. Secondly, we see not only a serpent crushing seed, but we see shame covering provision. In verse 21, it says, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin, skins and clothed them. Those fig leaves could go. God gave them something better. He killed an animal, sacrificed for them. And in the readers of Moses, who understood the temple of God would have seen in this language of garments and clothing and skin exactly what God did for the priest to enter into God's presence. Same words. We see hints here that God is gonna save his people through sacrifice. He's gonna atone for their sin, just like he atones for our sin by sacrificing his son. We enter his presence not by the temporary covering of slain animals, but by the permanent covering of the blood of Jesus. See, Adam and Eve wanted to be like God, but God, in his grace, comes down to earth, taking on flesh to save us. Here's what John Stott says. He says, the concept of substitution may be said then to lie at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives that belong to God alone, yet God accepts penalties that belong to man alone. This is where we find ourselves. That there are all sorts of tricks and tips about how we deal with temptation, but if all you find in this text is strategies to avoid temptation, no matter how good or how, or how helpful, then you miss the point of this. The point of this is that sin is real and the consequences are devastating, and each one of us is infected by that sin, and our world is broken by it, and so when we confront the wickedness in the world and the wickedness in our own heart, what are our options? We can't just ignore it, too many people have pretended that with, if, with enough education or charitable activity or religious behavior that things can be fixed, but they can't. If you think you're good enough to save yourself, you're in for disappointment. Or as a pastor friend of mine says, some folk are confusing Band-Aids and cough syrup for transplants and amputations. See, the only perfect, perfect permanent remedy is the death of Jesus on our behalf. We don't just need behavior modification. We need a new heart that can only come from God. So if we're gonna look at sin with clear-headedness, then we can admit we are lost, then we can be found. Here's what, the, what John says in 1 John 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the challenge. That today, you and I, would confess our sins, ask Jesus to forgive us, and walk by his spirit. What is a sinner supposed to do? Come to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness that he will gladly provide.